Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode, and I've got a guest for you today, Mike Fink, and um, he's actually quite a interesting guest, uh, quite um, complex, and he's going to talk to us about uh, decision making, and he's got a variety of stories, and um, as it relates to finances, should you quit your job, uh, are you marrying the right person, should you get a divorce, all these interesting questions, we'll just keep it very um you know, uh, general and brief. And for the audience that are interested, they can contact uh, Mike further. So Mike, welcome. Thank you very much, Christopher. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, well, you know, you and me, we had a quite an extensive um, pre-chat, uh, you know, pre-recording talk. And so, like I said, very briefly, I know you have a lot to share. Just one in one minute or two, just talk about who you are, what you do, and how the audience can benefit from your expertise. Thank you. So there's a saying that your wounds are your gifts. And what I'm going to talk about today is pretty much the result of two decades of expertise and five years of misery being stuck in a business relationship, in complete indecision, burning out. And out of this personal turmoil, I actually went back to connect to a process that I had developed over time, refined it, and went from anxiety to peace of mind and decision uh, in a short amount of time. And that personal transformation where I ended up uh, ending that relationship and, and then uh, realizing that there's actually a natural process to make decisions that we feel good about, that we can replicate. Um, this is how basically I started pivoting my life mission. So I used to be in personal development and life coaching, and now I'm focusing uh, specifically on helping people making very complex, high cost of failure decisions, whether they are life or business, such as uh, should I divorce or not? Because this is one of the toughest decisions that people can make. Should I quit my job? Should I get in a partnership with someone else? Should I go from being employed or working safely as a doctor to pursuing financial freedom? Should I get in a partnership? Should I buy a house versus renting? Any kind of decision that is complex and high cost of failure, I've decoded our process to make them in a way that we feel good about. Yeah, that's really interesting. And so, um, you know, we'll kind of uh, talk about it. Um, so I love this idea. And you, you've you created something called the decoding grid. Um, what, what is that? Just kind of very brief overview of what that, what that is. So I'll go quickly on this one. So do you see those two big cubes, um, Christopher? So what's the difference between, so for, for your audience, what's the difference between those two Rubik's cubes? Do you see color. them? Yeah, one is completely jumbled and the other one has all the colors aligned, right? Now, are there any pieces missing from the Ruby cube that has the colors jumbled? Or are all the pieces already there? All the pieces are the same, right? It's the same number of cubes and the same number of color stickers. So what I'm saying is that even though this color, uh, this Ruby cube has the colors jumbled, all the necessary elements to make the decision are already there. It's just that we don't know how to make sense of it. And the only difference to go from the jumbled cube to the solved cube is apply the proper sequence. So the decoding grid is a process that I discovered so that we can first gather all the pieces of information which are inside of us, that we become aware of them. We make them much more um, material and deliberate and then organize them in a proper sequence so that we can understand them and have clarity in terms of the proper decision. Most of the time it has to do with what is important to us, but not only that, understanding in what order, what's essential, what's optional, whether there are any clear deal breakers. And the third element that's really, really powerful is not only finding clarity through this process, but also presenting that piece of information to a part of our brain that is the gatekeeper of our decision, which is a part of our brain that keeps us locked emotionally. So have you ever had in your life a, pro a moment where maybe you knew logically what this right thing to do was? and yet you felt some emotional resistance that ever happened to you? It did, right? So in that case, it's because logically you know what to do. And for your audience, doctors are very well versed in, in the, the, the three brains that we have, but we have a primal brain in charge of our survival. We have an emotional brain in charge of our emotions, and we have a rational brain in charge of language and logic and reasoning. The problem is that they evolve at different times, the primal brain evolved 500 million years ago, the emotional brain 200 million years ago, and the most recent part, the logical part, evolved two to three million years ago. So the takeaway from that is that those parts of your brain, the primal brain and the emotional brain, do not understand words because they were evolved before we developed words and language. And it means that even if you have logical clarity with words, 
as long as you don't communicate in a different language to that part of your brain that keeps you stuck in the status quo, you won't be able to make a decision with your head, with your heart, and with your gut. Because whenever you have that kind of sense of certainty that you know that you are doing the right thing, but you also feel it emotionally, you know it in your guts, and you're also okay that regardless of what the final outcome will be, you'll be able to live with the consequence of your choice. That's a very kind of decision that you can make versus one that you say, ah, oh, you know what, there are pros and cons, and oh, yeah, and you go high, half-heartedly. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And uh, so I love this idea of uh, this conflict between the rational and the emotional brain. And, um, you know, because, I, you know, for the sake of time, uh, what's interesting is, uh, you know, some of the common scenarios among the audience are, um, especially for doctors, like um, they and, and they entered in the profession and could be for their parents wanted them to become doctors or you know, they thought it was going to be like this. It's like glamorized in television and, you know, and then it, and all of a sudden they, they get to it and they're like, oh my God, what, what is this? Um, you know, I mean, and so one question is the decision points, like how do you, you know, in this can apply to a lot of different things, entering into like making a decision and then like to make a decision to avoid that conflict or consequence versus making a decision to exit? What are the differences and how can you reconcile these two? Okay, so this is a great point, by the way, which has to do with how we make decisions in general, right? I mean, sometimes um, people go and make a career choice because not of their own things that they like or they enjoy, not because of their own values, but because it's the right thing to do. You know, in many cultures, I listen to a podcast, which is called How I Build This. And a lot of people who are from India or, or, or other Asian countries, there are three career choices, doctor, lawyer, or engineer, or failure. <laughs> Those are the, so a lot of people go maybe to do a career path that does not correspond to what, seem, to what they really value. So the first thing is actually self-awareness. Understand what is it that is really important to you? Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what other people say. It doesn't matter what society says. It doesn't matter what um, your friends say. The only thing that matters is what you think and what you feel most of all. What is it that makes you tick? And a lot of times we either repress those things because we don't want to disappoint our family, or we don't even take the time to really explore and formalize those things. Now, think about a career choice, Christopher. You know, we make decisions all the time, but most of those decisions are very low consequence. Like, should I put salt on my eggs? Well, whether you put salt or not, it's not going to make or break your day or life. But a career decision has more variables. You want something that fulfills you, that has a good salary, that maybe provides a sense of security. We have teamwork, the ability to, to grow, uh, that will enable you to uh, put money aside, that may be more passive versus active. I mean, there's a number of variables that are involved. And the higher number of variables, the more complex that decision becomes. Now, our brain, we have a working memory, which is about three to five units. And most people get confused, even if they have to deal with three variables already. If you go to the restaurant, if you don't know what to choose, a lot of time it's because, you know, if you have this experience, you look at the menu, ah, should I get the bird, should I get the fish? And it's because some, most people want something that is healthy, tasty, and maybe reasonably priced. And if you have something that matches all those three criteria, it's a go, go, go. If there's nothing that matches anything, it's a no, no, no. The problem is when you have one, but not the other. You have healthy, but not tasty. You have tasty, but uh, not healthy, or tasty, but not reasonably priced. It's a yes, but, yes, but, yes, but, and let's loop. And the only way out of that is to really become aware of, okay, what is really important to me and in what order? Because a lot of the times when people are finding themselves stuck in indecision is because they keep weighing the pros and cons. Yeah, I could do this. I should leave. Yes, but. But if I stay, yes, but. But what impact on my kids and what impact on my family? But what about my own happiness? Am I being self? I mean, there are all those things. And the only way out of that is understanding what's more important versus less important. What is essential versus optional. If you think about a relationship, the only way to know whether it's worthwhile to make a compromise is what should I compromise on? Well, is that something essential? Or is that something optional? In fact, let me give you an example of, uh, because you also deal with real estate. Let's say that you're looking for your dream house and you have 20 things that are important to you. And a friend of yours 
comes and tells you, hey, Christopher, I found this house. It has 19 things out of 20. Is it good or is it bad? Well, depends. What if the thing that's missing is that house is not in the city and state you want to live in? Well, all of a sudden, it becomes a moot point, right? So that's why I say that values are not an equal vote democracy. It doesn't matter how many you have out of the total. There are a military hierarchy because some are more important than others. And that's another thing that people need to understand. What is more important to me? Because maybe people want to have stability. They want to please their family, but maybe they also want to be fulfilled or have a sense of contribution or adventure. So as long as you don't make sense, as long as you don't take those pieces of the Rubik's Cube and put them in the proper order, you are bound to be lost in confusion. And once you have clarity, once you have ordered everything, it's like, okay, this is the right answer, but then it's about presenting that answer to your brain so that all parts of your brain can understand and it's all a go. Because indecision is characterized by the fact that there's no ideal option. So the key is to understand which option out of those that are there fulfills most, not only the things that are important to me and not most of the things, but the ones that are more important, the essential ones. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And I really love how you uh, describe these. Um, you know, it's kind of uh, one of the things I've really learned in, in residency is, uh, you know, avoid something before it happens. So, you know, make a decision not to get into something so you don't have to make a decision to get out of something. And you just kind of avoid all of that. You know, you talk about this um, this uh, indecision uh, prison and you talk about communicating with the brain's uh, gatekeeper. One thing I talk about is, you know, what strategies can one use to um, communicate with uh, what you call the brain's gatekeeper? What does that look like? That's a great question. So, you know, in business, there's a saying, if you want to make more money, the first thing to do is to stop losing money, right? So cut your expenses. So the one thing that does not work to convince your primal brain is language and words and logic. Your primal brain does not understand those, those you know, it's not the way it functions. So what does it understand if it's not words? So I'm going to guide you and, uh, you know, our listeners to a, a thought experiment because it's more powerful if the answer comes from you. Um, are you currently in a relationship, Christopher? Yeah, I've, I've, I'm already married and uh, with a family. So. Okay. I assume that if you were to find out that your spouse is having an affair, is cheating on you, you would be upset. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> so let's let's take this example. I'm going to present you the same information, but in four different scenarios, four different ways. And then each time I want you to kind of assess your level of upset based on how you found out that, that information. So the first scenario is a person comes and tells you verbally, hey, Christopher, your wife is having an affair with another woman, just verbally. And you don't know, sorry, your wife is having an affair with another man. And you don't know what this other man looks like. I guess you'd be pretty upset, right? So just kind of assess how upset you would be. Now, there's a second scenario where I tell you, hey, a person comes and says, Christopher, your, wife, your spouse is having an affair with another man. And you know what the other man looks like. It's not a close friend, but you know what they look like. Scenario number three, they come and they tell you your wife is having an affair and they show you pictures of your wife kissing and being intimate with another man. And scenario number four is you come home, you open the door and you find your spouse being intimate with another person right in front of your eyes. Out of all those four scenarios, which one is the one that you feel most upset Probably the probably the last the last one, right? And isn't that interesting? Because it's the exact same piece of information. It's that your wife is having or your spouse is having an affair, right? And yet the difference is, you know, the ability that we have to visualize. In the first scenario, it was just hearing that your spouse was having an affair, and you didn't even know what the other what the other person was look looked like. In the second one, you had a better ability to visualize internally because you know what the other person looked like. In the third scenario, you have pictures, four scenarios, you see it live. So the part, the language that this part of your brain understands that your primal brain, the gatekeeper in charge of your survival understands is images, is the visual representation. So have you ever wondered, like, for example, when you see a movie and you know it's gonna be a happy ending, 
And yet you are caught up in the movie. Maybe it's a horror movie and you know it's going to end well, but you're still caught in the moment. Or maybe it's a Rocky Balboa and you already seen the movie and you know that he's going to win. And yet you are still caught in that emotion. Did that ever happen to you? Okay. So why? You could think, well, doesn't make sense. Logic. I know he's going to win. But what does the brain see? The brain does know, doesn't understand logic. The part of the emotional brain is the one that does not understand language, but it sees on the screen, it sees the images of Rocky being bitten and sweating. So the visual channel is much more powerful to communicate with those parts of the brain. That's one thing. The other thing is that the visual channel is also much more effective in considering a large number of variables than the auditory channel. And the auditory channel is language, it's writing, it's discussing, it's journaling. Let me give you another third experiment. Let's imagine that I'm taking you to a cocktail party and there's a lot of people talking into the room. And in the first scenario, I'm gonna put you a blindfold on, you don't see anything. And I tell you, hey, Christopher, go inside the room. There are between five to 10 people talking actively inside the room. Just by listening to people talking, Tell me how many people are, are inside the room. How long do you think it would take to come up with an answer? A few minutes? Yeah, I would say a few minutes. Right. How certain would you be of that answer? Fairly uncertain. Okay. Now let's imagine a second scenario. This time I remove the blindfold. I put earplugs in your ears and you have your eyes open. You get inside the room and I ask you how many people are in the center of the room talking to one another. How long does it take you to get the proper answer? I mean, faster than the previous scenario. For sure. And how certain would you be of your, of your answer? More certain. Absolutely. So this is another advantage of the visual channel is that it can consider a very large amount of variables all at once. There is, uh, you know, 30 percent, 30% uh, of our neurons in our brain, and correct me if my statistic is, is not right, are dedicated to the visual channel. So you can grasp much more information through the visual channel. You can see, wow, there are seven people in the room versus the auditory channel, which is sequential. One is all at once. The auditory is sequential one after one and the other. So once you have gathered all the pieces of information that are important to you, you have ordered them in terms of what's essential, what's optional, whether there are any clear deal breakers, then you need to find a visual way to display that information to your brain so that not only you understand your decision logically, but also you get this kind of visceral feeling. You see you can have an immediate assessment of your relationship, of your decision, whether to quit your job or not, by having a view where your brain understands because you are using color coding that your brain has been preconditioned to understand, go versus no go, at a very emotional and visceral level. And once you have that alignment, your head, your heart, and your gut are aligned because you are communicating with clarity to all parts of your brain. Does that make sense? Yeah, really fascinating. And I, like I said, uh, um, I really love your passion and your expertise. And um, you, you're the first guest that described decision making in this, in this, in this term, in this way. Um, there's a great book that I read. It was called the, by Annie Duke, and she's a pro professional poker player. She talks about decision, mm -hmm. but that's in terms of like odds. And this is interesting talking about, you know, emotions and logic and kind of, um, you know, it's probably how can people uh, find out more about you? I know because you have a book and, you know, you do a lot of uh, webinars and, and we may have you on as a second guest. And um, and how can they reach you and contact you? Thank you. So I have just written and come out with a book called Divorce Decision Decoded. Yeah. So you can go to divorcedecisiondecoded.com. So it's the title of the book.com. Or you can also go to my website, getabsoluteclarity.com. So it kind of makes sense. And there you'll be able to get the book. And by the way, even though the book is focused on divorce, the process and the methodology is applicable to a wide range of decisions. And for you know, any of you who want to find out more, how I can help you directly, how you can apply those principles directly to your own life. If you're stuck in decision, if you don't know what to do, if you're weighing the pros and cons, if you've been considering a decision for a long time, whether it's divorce, should I quit my job or anything else? It means that 
you don't have the proper process, the proper sequence to go from that cube to that cube. And I can help you. So go to getabsoluteclarity.com. You'll be able to contact me and we can book a discovery call so I can better see how I can best help you. Interesting. And for all the audience, I'm um, listening, Mike, for coming on. And um, I really enjoyed this conversation and uh, all the uh, real life scenarios. Um, be sure to give Mike's socials a like and follow and check out his book and his website and reach out to him. And thanks so much for coming on. It was my true pleasure, Christopher. Thank you so much for having me.